feel uh, very well after this hand clapping so strong. Uh, and I think so, so feel my, my friends. I think uh, this session, I didn't have the time to prepare for it. But about 20 years ago, I've been doing the same job of these two gentlemen. And uh, I think the, these are two very gentlemen, very important gentlemen for me. Uh, because uh, Pietro Spirito is the almost, I could still say, new president, but he has already done many things, uh, of the Port Authority of uh, Mediterranean Centrale, which Can includes uh, Napoli and Salerno and other places like Castellammare. And uh, obviously this is a job I've done in the last millennium. <laughs> Uh, so I think he's uh, very important, not only for me, but for the city of Naples. And um, Mark is the president, I think, of one of the largest ports in, in the world, which is the port of Antwerp. Um, when I took over my position of president of the newly instituted uh, Port Authority of Naples in '96. Um, I had a friend who was, uh, still is, very old now and respected historian. He was also an MP. His name is Giuseppe Galasso. And he took me uh, with him and he made me a sort of lesson of what the ports are. And I said, okay, this man is becoming old. He wants to teach me. Okay, I'm not a logistic expert, but, you know, having been all my life a shipping lawyer, I think I knew something about ports. And he said, uh, you know, the port is it's not really the, the piers, the, 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 um, the breakwaters. Uh, the, the, the port is a city, is uh, a land, is a community. And, uh, you know, Naples and Antwerp, before being ports or good ports or channels or rivers in a bay, and, they, they are important shipping cities, like in Italy we have Venice, Genoa, and some others. So these cities, they, they have a culture, and the port is there not only to feed the consumption market or, the or to help the export of the local industry or agriculture, or to bring the people in to visit or out to go to other places, or to the islands, uh, or to connect with the other infrastructures, which is something we will talk. But, uh, you, you know, the, the port of a big... You know, our port, Naples, is not the largest port in Italy. It's, uh, uh, I think uh, Anverba is a huge multiple, as, uh, perhaps 10 times or 20 times what we are in terms of trade in some sectors at least, perhaps not passengers, no, but not some passengers. other sectors. Uh, and in Italy there are a lot of ports, uh, Gioia Tauro for Cortenas, Genoa a bit for everything, uh, Trieste. Trieste, Venice and some other, which uh, Ravenna for um, uh, general cargo. Uh, Legon for all. But Naples is the largest city on the sea, and it was founded because of this. And obviously, Genoa and Venice are a very important tradition, and they're also cities of the sea. We, we have been also the capital of a kingdom, and so I think this notion of sea has been a little bit lost. So I would like to start to ask. Pietro Spirito, and he has been working in, uh, uh, in the north of Italy, in central Italy, in Rome. He has done a lot of things in his life. I must say, he is also finding the time, I think, uh, to teach at university. Yeah. Are you still doing this? Yeah, I do. And he is a man who has done a lot of things on the land, like railways, public transportation, logistics, uh, uh, and a lot of other things. So I think he can understand the, my old historian friend um, um, lesson, because in the end he gave me a very useful lesson. Uh, do you think that something has changed since uh, 
the time that the, the port was founded because it was uh, in some way the door of a community that was living, producing, consuming. Uh, thanks Francesco, thanks to, for the opportunity to discuss uh, with the president of the, such an important port like Antwerp and uh, an international conference that is very important for the teams we are uh, discussing on. Uh, the door is quite the same now, but the environment is completely changed. Uh, the interland uh, around the ports uh, has uh, a completely different attitude. Uh, we are now facing uh, Industry 4.0, uh, the digital economy, uh, the e-commerce. So, uh, in terms of uh, industrial process, uh, the environment is completely different. The door has the same function. But behind us and in front of us, there is a completely different world. So the port is the frontier, but the borders are changing quickly, very quickly. The point is that uh, uh, we need to be deeply in the root of the landscape. So we need that uh, uh, there is a complete understanding uh, of what is the function of the fort for the community, for the industrial community and for the uh, city community. Uh, the industrial community means that uh, we must serve as a, a, a factor of competitiveness for our industry in terms of raw material that are incoming and uh, the products that are going for exports. Uh, and that the logistics has completely changed. In the past, logistics was part of uh, the branch of the fabric. Now, logistics is an industry itself. And uh, the border between uh, industry and logistics is not quite clear. Because if you take Amazon, for example, Amazon is an industry and is also a logistic company together. So uh, the, uh, the mix in the contemporary world is a mix in which uh, logistics is becoming uh, part integration, uh, the indecisive part uh, for the formation of the value added in the new economy. And uh, on that point, uh, I feel that the Germans has done, uh, have done uh, in the past decades an important uh, uh, transformation. Uh, uh, in, uh, in the last decades, uh, the Americans were the main, uh, main actor in the world for logistics. Now, the Germans are the country number one, because DHL is the property of the German post, Schenker is the, in the hands of the railway, uh, the German railway, and uh, uh, the, polit the industrial policy now has become a logistic policy too. And so this is one of the issues on which we have to work on. So, also, the ports need to change uh, uh, mental attitude toward the future. We are not only infrastructure. Thank you, yeah. Pietro. And um, how do you look at uh, the land-sea uh, connection from uh, the north? Uh, Antwerp has been an Anseatic city and has a very long tradition of um, port and CCT. I think you are also the vice mayor of... Uh, the city is. Antwerp. Yes, uh, this morning someone said, the moderator, what I so find so interesting of Napoli is that the city and the port are still one. That gives a lot of advantages in terms of public support, but in terms of port expansion, it gives a lot of disadvantages. What happened in Antwerp was that the port area grew out far in the north from the port. We annexated a lot of villages and agricultural land, and now the Port Authority of Antwerp is governing a vast territory of 130, 130 square kilometers, not only of cargo handling, but the largest petrochemical cluster of Europe and the largest logistical warehouse cluster of Europe with a lot of added value activities. And so 
that brings with us that we have to invest a lot of money, a lot of public money, of the Port Authority and of the government in really essential infrastructure. We spoke this morning about the consolidation of the big container lines, for, in, for instance. They're bringing in bigger ships. We had to deepen the river. We have to build huge new container terminals. So there is a lot of pressure upon investing public money in order to remain a big maritime seaport. And that's what we try to do. But it's uh, really not easy in order to get public support because you have to explain to the people that in order to maintain what we have, we still have to grow. And, and, and then, of course, the big question comes, why all those big container vessels why do they only come to the major Northwest European ports? Part of the answer, and forgive me for being a little bit arrogant, but I think some of those ports are performing better, having from the past and now on a better governance and less union problems and less bureaucracy. But from a European port point of view, and that's a little bit against my own interest as Antwerp. In the Europe 10T network of connecting all the regions on land, of, it would be, it makes much more sense to make more use of several ports in Europe, whereas now the major cargo flows are all coming in. I mean the major cargo flows from Asia, but also from America. I, I speaking about containerized cargo. I'm coming in f via the Northwest European ports and then are distributed also to the south of Europe. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, Pietro, do you um, agree with, the, uh, with this about the competitivity of Northern port? What, what, uh, do you think is there really a competition between a port like, for instance, Naples that is a very interesting regional port in the end, yeah. and uh, the port of the Northern Range. I think that is completely a different level. Uh, there is a gap in terms of competitiveness. The Northern Port uh, started before to work in a worldwide environment, and so there is a, clearly an, an advantage that is, uh, for me, a value added for Europe. It's not a problem, it's an opportunity. And on the other side, as uh, my friend said before, there's a question of uh, uh, government not only within the port, uh, but uh, in a more uh, uh, larger space uh, in, uh, uh, in the future, in the next year, we will have the economic special zone in Naples and Salerno. And the vision of the Italian government is that uh, the port must uh, be included also with the logistic areas uh, around us. For example, the freight villages in Nola and Marcianise. That must be a common network. The port alone, it's not more a value. The port linked to the logistic behind the port is the issue. As the president said before. Which was the start of our conversation. Absolutely. Uh, Taking it from here, uh, very short, then we can add. Uh, how do you see the mission of the Port of Naples and uh, also in planning the infrastructures, the investment? Um, you know, uh, there was an older man now, uh, Mr. Bassolino, Mr. Yeah. Barbieri. He thought that the, uh, and also the, that the Port should, of Naples should have been shut down and in all the its eastern commercial part, or to even the dry docks, and only uh, left in this passenger to be, at, at that time there was a wall, and we knocked it down because the mayor wanted to do it, and it was a very good idea, but we didn't want to wait to have the polyfunction of yeah. the port with an industrial ship repair, uh, um, um, how do you say, a cargo, and the passenger or passenger with cars or cruise area, which is in, in the West. So, 
but uh, obviously I think in, even though probably you will agree with me that Naples should remain uh, multi-purpose. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think what are the strategic area that you see we have um, the better chances? Yeah. First of all, we have to consider that uh, there is a sport system for the Campania region because the distance between Napoli and Salerno is 50 kilometers. We are a port, not two ports, because uh, all the world experiences are that the system is really functioning. If you take Los Angeles, it's a port of 80 kilometers. That's the reality. Uh, with different uh, uh, attitudes, specializations. So first of all, to, to create a vision that is not provincialistic vision. In Italy, regional at least. Re regional at least. <laughs> That's the first point. The second point, in Naples in particular, is to create order. Order, you know what, what I understand. Naples is uh, a historic development of the port without order. Clearly, we are multifunctional, but to be efficient in multifunctional terms, we need a clear vision of the allocation of the functions within the port. Uh, the length of the port of Naples is 20 kilometers, not, not so short. We have a problem of the city around us, and we need to build a master plan, we are working on that, in which it's clear the division between passengers and commercial, but within commercial containers, uh, motorways of the sea, uh, energy. So we need to be clear with the operators on which the function are within the plan. Because in, uh, in the past, you know, yeah. uh, there were the privates that wanted to be in, 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 in some way. It's, it was not important where. I want to stay in the port anyway. It's, this is a mess of confusion. Yeah. We need that the port authority will decide what is the place and then the market will yeah, the, the, on This is the job of the yeah. port authority, in yeah. fact, while the job of the private is then yeah. uh, to, to, to run efficiently the, the terminals and the activities. Uh, is, is that the lesson also yeah. that comes what from um, the North Sea and from Antwerp? Yes, what the scale. I think one one, only one of the success factors of the Northwest European port is governance. I lived at times 30 years ago that the port of Antwerp was simply governed and administrated by the city bureaucracy administration. So every small decision had to pass through the city council. That gave a lot of bureaucracy, but also a lot of political discussion. Whom to give a concession to, whom not. So what during the last 25 years happened is that the city remained the only shareholder of the port, so not a regional or the national government. The city is the only owner of the port area, huge area, but the governance is done by an autonomous body and the board of that body which I am presiding half of the board six people are appointed by the shareholder the city the mayor is in my board I'm the president of the board some other people of different political parties but half the other half are independent commissioners coming out of uh, the, the industry but not industry, not stakeholders within the port yeah. area, but people uh, knowing uh, how to govern, uh, how to manage a corporation. And the, the people working for the port authority, 1,600 people, are not civil servants anymore, but are appointed by that autonomous body. And that kind of model in different ways I think it's a very, and we don't do, of course, as a port authority, any commercial or economic debts for the private sector. And I think that mixed model is a proof to be in also Rotterdam, Hamburg, a very good model. The, the level of authority where we have the most problems now with is Europe. Because Europe tends to regard upon port authorities as undertakings as enterprises, 
and want to introduce corporate taxation to the ports of Europe. And they're doing that in a very awkward way. They're starting with the Netherlands, France, Belgium, not the other ports. Say, what's that? There are hundred ways of governing ports in Europe. And Europe is trying to, to, to make some level playing field, but I think on a very amateuristic way, uh, due to the pressure of DG competition, that's a state in the state in the European Commission, DG competition, everybody is afraid of DG competition. <laughs> and uh, we are uh, going to appeal, saying that's not true, we are ports, we are responsible for the public good, yeah. we are serving the community, we are not result and, and benefit yes. making bodies, we are there for the community. Yes, you are not a businessman, you are a no. civil servant. No. Uh, and uh, we understand this. I think it's very interesting. Uh, the, obviously, there are many subjects. At my time, I had uh, 21, something in between the thing you have now and the 12 people you have in your committee. We had about 20 people plus me, starting from the <coughs> governor of the region, the metropolitan, provincia, the city, the various cities, and only Naples, but also and the it's Daniel a big Operator. mistake, <coughs> we, yes, I think you are good in saying that this is a, a, a system, what, yeah. what, what we always want. When I made this proposal, I think in Salerno they were not very happy, <laughs> 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 Naples, and, and now I think we are arriving to this in a very clever and gradual uh, and mild way. Um, and, um, but how, he, my question is, uh, I think you have a, a board of uh, five. Five, uh, so one people is the president. Yeah, my, myself, then yes. uh, the uh, representative of the, of the region, the representative of the municipality of Naples, of the area metropolitan of Naples, and then the municipality of Salerno, Salerno and then the maritime director. Casalamare, no. Casalamare is not represented. Well. Okay, but there is the region. It's the, that, okay. the, 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 the metropolitan so area you of Naples. So to be fair to <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you, do, you, do you think, so I was able to see the advantage, because obviously when I had Mr. Rastrelli was the president of the region, or Mr. Basolino was the president, the, the mayor, and then he became was the president. And, and all these people, you know, it was easier, and we had the president of the industries and all, all the, the terminal operators and the owners and, and this and that. And the unions, we had six people of the union. The first time we had the, the leaders of the, it was a very difficult because they were <laughs> very tough politicians, was a very big, but at least, the, this made things lower, but you know, in the end, you could arrive to some sort of result, and we did many things like, like this. So now the danger is that you go ahead with your people. I know you, these people. I know some of them, and are very happy that they are working with you and your general secretary yeah. in the interest of the port authority. Um, but um, at the same time, there is not the danger that you find yourself too much forward. And uh, uh, I know you are a very experienced civil servant, and uh, also, I mean, you dealt as a consultant in many infrastructural pro project of the central government in Rome, in uh, Emilia. And so you, you have a lot of background experience, but I know you and I like you also as a sort of strong man. Uh, and uh, don't you find some time too much forward because this is a danger of people like uh, the people, unfortunately, I was also one of them who want to do things and who do things. And they say, oh, you have taken the decision without discussing. But you, you know, we have been telling this you and you seem everything okay, this is a good thing. You, 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 you don't think that, that there is this risk for... for um, I think that there is an opportunity because uh, we have the board. I am dependent directly from the state, uh, from the ministry. Uh, then we have uh, a table for partnership with the operators. It's a different body in which I have confrontation with the, the industry. They are not deciding, but I'm consulting them frequently. And so I have a, I have a table of discussion of uh, uh, also of uh, uh, identification of the future strategy 
and also of convincement uh, of discussion. So I think that uh, really uh, there is no... This is the president of the region. <laughs> <laughs> He's not, uh, he doesn't agree. <laughs> we have a good uh, uh, interaction because uh, in Italy we have three different levels of government. So I depend from the central government, but in the board I have the two institutional levels of the uh, territory, region and uh, municipalities. And uh, this is a, a point of equilibrium. On the other side, the industry is represented in another body. When I was in the railways, uh, I participated to the old system in the port of Genova and in the port of Civitavecchia. I was a member of the old board, and it was very dif difficult to take a decision where there was a conflict of interest uh, with the, the presence directly of the operators inside the board that will take a decision. This was a, really a, a, a point of difficulty for you when you were president before. So I think that uh, dividing uh, the functions, we are public, as the president said before, and we have a discussion, a confrontation with the, the private operators. And this is good because uh, the role are different. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, um, Mark, you have been, and you still are, a um, very clever and experienced politician, not only a shipping and port person. Uh, I, th I th and think this is a great advantage. Uh, yes, as Pietro said, I discovered uh, <laughs> how difficult it was uh, to deal politically at a certain level. I remember uh, now you, I think, have changed this uh, as I wanted. The, 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 we were filling the, the keys inside to make motor terminal, and I got one um, decided in the master plan. But I wanted to have the opportunity to do it also in, uh, in other cases progressively. You know, I spoke with the head of the industry, with the mayor, with the, and they appeared all agree. But in fact, they agreed among them that this should not have been allowed. So, uh, and you know why? Because I think there was uh, some, uh, uh, they were afraid, the local operators, that in making a port too big with a lot of areas, other people might have come down. And they wanted to keep the control. I realized this afterwards. And so, they said, that, well, this has been decided in Rome. You said, we depend on the center. And I said to these most senior people of my committee, yes, but there is a problem. We are now in Naples, and I bring this to the vote. I was the only votation I lost. It was my vote against, I think, all the other people, because it was decided in Rome. But I, I didn't think that the decision should have been taken in non-institutional places in Rome, but should have been taken in the right place. In Naples, I was minority. Now Pietro Spirito is doing what I would after 20 years, what I would have liked to do then. Do you have this problem? And uh, being a politician, how do you suggest Pietro uh, to deal oh, I, <laughs> in situations no, 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 like no, this? I, I, uh, port reality in Europe is so different yes. that it's not so wise to give each other advice. Mm. I'm much more concerned about the pressure on ports from commercial enterprises, international headquarters, mm -hmm and they are playing ports against each other. Because we spoke about the big container shipping lines. In order to survive, they consolidated. To my great uh, surprise, the European competition authorities, very, very, very keen on, even on Google and Amazon. But when the three major container shipping lines, not merged, but consolidated, even in the P3 times, uh, the three together, three years ago, there was no objection at all of the competition uh, authorities of Europe. Incredible. I didn't understand that. That same companies, uh, which are doing a very good job, but are putting a lot of pressure on port authorities to invest even more public money, to uh, host bigger ships. They are doing the same thing with terminal operators. Terminal operators also are big international companies, DPW, PSA, etc., picking up the ports. And so local authorities 
if they are uh, city owned or uh, state owned makes no difference you cannot uh, you can expand the port but you cannot put the port in another place so we have to uh, there is a real issue about spend to spend public money and sometimes too much public money just given in to considerations of international market players who are not accountable to the public where we are they are not they are saying if you are not attractive enough as a port then we go elsewhere and i think that's our major issue for european ports uh, at the moment thank you mark so i think we have uh, last minute or so yeah uh, Pietro, now let's go really to the nuts and bolts. Uh, I think one idea, one strategic um, investment or change or improvement or mission that you know you see for the port of Naples, we said is a multifunctional yeah. port. So we don't want to waive things that are not necessary. I mean, you want to raise certain things that are dangerous for the environment or for the uh, safety or do it in a different manner. Yeah. One question, do you think that the, the oil terminal, which is, uh, could stay in the port of Naples or would you like to bring it uh, perhaps in a little key outside? The it's a practical matter. Uh, when I arrived in Naples, there was this uh, discussion about the delocalization of the uh, Darsera Petroli, you know. Uh, but the localization means to put uh, a place in another place. I said, well, what Where? is the other place? Where? <laughs> they <laughs> didn't know. They didn't know. They so, said in Mondragon, but it's not possible. So for me, the discussion is finished. Yeah. If there is another place, for me, it's not a problem. They will stay where they stay. But it's an important issue for the European ports about the energy of the future because certainly oil and gas will remain important. And but we don't want this to be transported on land with yeah. higher risk yeah. and our Absolutely. pollution. But, but, but one question, uh, the, 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 obviously the oil people, I understand also their position, they would like to have everything on, on, on the earth as close yeah. and as comfortable and as good for them. Uh, we would like, I think, and you are hopefully, uh, not hopefully, but I, I guess you may be uh, of this way, you want to bring it a little bit outside. Uh, um, I think there was a project on the boy for the Bay of Naples. Don't you think that this may be surrounded by a little key in, in order to contain potential pollution? But uh, this is the first issue which I'm working with the oil company. You know that, the, that in previously in Naples there were the refineries. Yes. So the number of the uh, de depot is uh, yes. much more higher than the necessity. Yes. Now we have four million of ton of oil in Naples yes. from the port. And uh, the capacity of the depot is much more higher. So we don't need... Uh, yeah, the, the, but the, these depots themselves, I think, uh, they can be a bit dangerous if... Yeah. yeah so the, so not, the, not so much the vessels if yeah. they are... Um, put in, no, in, in the right that, place. I, I feel that with the, the first stage is to rationalize the area. So we can uh, reduce the number of the square meters that are and used. And use the square and, meters yeah, for, for the community. For, for the free zone, Absolutely. but also for... Uh, for other uh, for, energy for, 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 matter. And, and also for, to have a park, to have Absolutely. something... So we, I'm discussing with the oil company, well, you can stay, but you have to build another pact. And I community. think if you are able to break the heads, I'm joking, because they, yeah. our heads, all yeah. our heads yeah. are very hard, yeah. but you will make them a favor because they can, will be able to plan I the think future. So. I and think also so. the ship owners, they will know exactly the size of the vessel, the type, if should be a refrigerated vessel of that. I'm discussing with them. We, we have got a, a gas owner in front of us, who's yeah. the president of the Italian owners. Uh, and, sorry, and in particular, I'm working uh, on... Did you have a project? Yeah, I have a project from the LNG. Many, I know. From the LNG yes. uh, depot, because uh, we have a, a national plan in Italy. Uh, in that plan, there is the provision of the, that eight Italian ports will have a, dep a, ba a bunker for LNG. And I want that the port of Naples will be one of the first for, uh, 
renewable energy. So and, and this would that. fit also with uh, all that will be yeah, s has absolutely. been said in part this morning, will be said tomorrow morning yeah. when we have the, this very interesting technological session. Yeah. Thank you, Pietro. And uh, Mark, uh, I've seen the beautiful uh, new uh, building of uh, the Port Authority. It's one of them. It looks like a vessel. Is uh, the yeah, ship? It, you, it, it looks like a vessel or a diamond. But uh -huh. I asked the architect uh, Zaha Did, who uh -huh. deceased, when she came for the groundbreaking ceremony. I asked, "What do we have to see in that beautiful new pearl of the port house?" And she said uh, very profoundly. You see in it what you want to see in it. So the architect itself, you can see a ship or a diamond, but mostly it's both because that are the most important export and import industries of Antwerp, that's diamonds and shipping and ports, of course. So the port house also is a diamond for the city and also a symbol of how important the port is for the prosperity of the city and of the country. And much more than only Belgium, we are a European port. We are the most important port for France. Antwerp is the most important port for France. Together with Amsterdam and Rotterdam, Antwerp is serving all the western region yeah. of Germany. So these are really European ports on a European level. And uh, so I would hope to have a little bit more I, interest. I, I, from I have a last question for you, and I would like yeah. also to have his uh, say or no. I remember these trips, the uh, first time we went to the sea trade in Miami, and I had the luck to meet uh, Mickey Harrison, yeah. and he came to my press conference. We were just pictures of how beautiful Naples was yeah. <laughs> because the, the, we were at the start of all the projects that. Uh, um, I, I think this time were very good uh, uh, brainstorming time because this delegate, okay, there were the people of the unions of the, uh, the various, uh, the various uh, interests and, and entrepreneurial interests, but the traveling all together always, we got, got closer, we got friends, we could understand each other, they could understand each other, and we had some new ideas because when you travel. So, if um, We'll um, had this idea. Um, will we think in the future to have uh, with some of the people who are here, President Spirito, a little symposium in your beautiful uh, architectural diamond uh, treasury, which is yeah. also a ship? Yeah, I am always willing to host uh, important people from this region, from the Mediterranean, from Italy, from southern Italy. The port house is really meant to be very hospitable towards everybody in the industry. And will you chair this uh, delegation from Absolutely. Italy? Absolutely, I will be enthusiastic. Okay, okay. <laughs> let's good. done. The tourist agent thank you. can thank us. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you very much. And I would like to have now uh, 15 minutes with uh, a very good friend of mine, a friend of my family, uh, a very respected um, owner, uh, is the two oldest but still very active owners in Italy are Aldo Grimaldi and Peppino D'Amato. And I asked to a very good friend of mine and one of our best maritime journalists, Bianca D'Antonio, to have a talk with Peppino. Bianca said, but you should stay on the stage. But obviously she has to interview Peppino because she's a lady, she's a journalist. And uh, Mr. D'Amato has a lot of things that he could say, uh, but I'm sure that he, uh, Bianca will make him some of the most interesting question that he could that she could make to, to a man who has got such a long history that I think dates back from the previous generations. Welcome, Peppino. I think uh, we should big applause. Oh. Thank you again. The floor, I hand you the floor.
nostro amico Peppino. E voi tutti lo conoscete, volevo un altro applauso a Peppino perché due giorni fa ha compiuto 91 anni. Quindi... Ed è ancora, va in ufficio tutti i santi giorni, il figlio lo deve spingere a tornare a casa, e è ancora attivo, ha una mente lucidissima e è considerato il saggio di tutto l'armamento. Allora, a Peppino, io che cosa voglio chiedere innanzitutto? Tu hai vissuto le varie crisi dello shipping, le crisi dopo la guerra, le crisi de della chiusura del canale di Suez e che cosa c'è di diverso dalla crisi che ha colpito dal 2008 lo shipping e che non si è ancora attenuata? Se mi vuoi spiegare? Prima di tutto desidero ringraziare, ma veramente con cuore, Francesco Lauro, perché questa è l'ottava volta che fa una manifestazione del genere che arricchisce un po' tutti quanti noi ed è un prestigio per Napoli. Grazie Francesco. Ciao Francesco. Dunque, sono 73 anni che io sono nello shipping. A 18 anni ho cominciato a lavorare nello shipping e conosco tutte le crisi, anche quelle degli anni 30. Eh, ma eri piccolo però. Sì, avevo 6 o 7 anni. E, e perché le conosco? Perché allora la ditta era formata da mio padre, Umberto D'Amato, e dal mio nonno materno, Giuseppe Palomba. E avevano velieri. Però riuscirono ad acquistare, e da allora era una cosa veniristica, un piroscafo a vapore che è di 800 tonnellate, il quale rispetto ai veliri aveva il vantaggio di non fermarsi quando non c'era vento. E quindi praticamente era qualcosa che valeva molto più dei veliri. Ebbene, questa nave sette fermo negli anni 33-34, 1933 per diversi mesi nel porto di Torre del Greco. E io lo ricordo perché andavo a fare i bagni ecco. su questa nave. Quindi questa è, è, è la crisi degli anni 30, che certamente è, dopo di questa è, è la più grave che abbiamo avuto. Ora, la differenza sostanziale rispetto alla, a, alle crisi precedenti e alla crisi attuale è che prima fermavano centinaia e centinaia di navi perché non esistevano carichi, non perché i carichi erano bassi, perché non esistevano carichi. Mi ricordo che noi negli anni Ottanto comprammo una Panamax che ci venne consegnata in Brasile. Il Brasile normalmente è posto di caricazione. Questa nave rimase ferma due mesi perché non trovavamo nessun carico nemmeno a nolo basso. Per di quella di prima. Oggi invece non c'è nessuna nave ferma, sia le cisterne, sia le bulk navigano regolarmente e, e quante più navi arrivano, tante più possibilità esistono. Dice, ma allora perché il mercato è basso? Il mercato è basso perché molti armatori, ma specialmente i cinesi, comprano le più vecchie navi demolite, da demolire e le fanno navigare. L'equipaggio cinese rispetto a, al nostro equipaggio costa la decima parte e quindi loro possono accettare qualsiasi no. Anche quando noi abbiamo avuto in questa crisi che dura ormai da quasi dieci anni, abbiamo avuto le Panamax che valevano 3.000 dollari al giorno. Sai cosa significa? Quando solamente di gestione ce ne vogliono più del doppio, solo per la gestione, a parte di, i finanziamenti. Quindi voi potete capire che è, 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 effettivamente questo è, è un, un fatto che bisognerebbe risolvere. E, e secondo, eh, secondo me... te qual è la... c'hai una ricetta per uscire da questa situazione? Eh, guarda, eh, io penso che eh, si sta verificando in questi ultimi tempi un buon miglioramento per il carico secco. secco. Eh, e secondo me potrebbe continuare perché... Perché fra un anno e mezzo, due anni, tutte le navi 
dovranno mettere questi nuovi apparecchi per la zavorra ed è stato già verificato che per ogni nave occorrono all'incirca un milione di dollari per mettere queste nuove apparecchiature. Ora capisci bene che una nave vecchia per l'armatore non conviene spendere un milione su una nave che ne vale due e quindi io spero Sarà perché andando via demolendo tante navi vecchie il mercato dovrebbe mantenersi ancora buono questo è quello che penso quindi spero che effettivamente che se si verifichi che la Cina che attualmente non ha ancora approvato questo regolamento per la Zavorra lo accetti perché effettivamente ripeto i cinesi sono quelli che hanno comprato più navi e quindi potremmo avere una soluzione del problema. Voglio anche dire ai miei colleghi armatori italiani e mondiali che costruire è un gravissimo errore perché con la metà dei soldi che costa una nuova costruzione oggi si possono acquistare delle navi esistenti di 4-5 anni a metà del prezzo. E questo non solo c'è il vantaggio per il prezzo, ma c'è anche il vantaggio di non aumentare la flotta e quindi rendere ancora più difficoltosa la soluzione. E di aiutare vita. gli armatori in difficoltà. Esatto, sì. anche, no? Peppino, pensando alla tua esperienza, e sei stato vicepresidente di Confitarma per parecchio tempo, che consigli dai al nostro nuovo presidente Mario Mattioli? Guardate, io voglio molto bene a Mario perché... È un ragazzo veramente per bene, capace e sono sicuro che farà un ottimo lavoro. Voglio ricordare che lui si era candidato ultimamente, prima, quando poi è stato eletto uh, Manuel Grimaldi, e quando seppe che Manuel aveva accettato la candidatura, lui ritirò la sua. È stato molto veramente un, un atto molto signorile e io lo ringrazio ancora e sono certo che con la sua saggezza anzi lui oltretutto è il figlio della signora Laura Cafiro del gruppo Cafiro eh sì. eh, che ho avuto l'onore e il piacere di conoscere in Confidamma eh, posso assicurare che era la più grande imprenditrice del settore molto signora Beh, e molto bella pure molto bella molto guasta. signora è molto brava molto brava veramente lì si è eccezionale per cui il figlio non può essere da me. E certo che no. Senti, parlando di persone che hai conosciuto, tu hai, sei venuto a contatto e hai conosciuto armatori di grosso calibro, quelli che non ci sono, come Achille Lauro, come Antonio D'Amico, come Guido Grimaldi. Nel tuo libro dei ricordi di queste persone, cosa c'è? Qualche aneddoto, qualche... Eh, guardi, io Achille Lauro l'ho conosciuto benissimo perché... Lui era il presidente dell'associazione meridionale che esisteva a Napoli. Tu sai, prima c'erano tre sede, organizzazioni, sì, sì. quella di Napoli, Genova, Roma, quella Roma. di Genova e quella di, 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 di Venezia. Quindi eh, io andavo alle riunioni fatte da, da, da Lauro e, e ti posso assicurare che le cose andavano bene. Il, il direttore era l'avvocato in Bruglio e del quale posso adesso un nipote uh -huh. che scrive sul giornale l'avvistatore marittimo. Sì. Quindi Dico, ma con Lauro ti è capitato qualche poi, cosa, qualche poi, approccio. Eh, si fece la fusione delle, delle varie organizzazioni, l'unica della, della, della Confitarma, e il presidente fra i primi presidenti proprio a Chile Lauro. Uh -huh. E, e mi ricordo che fra i, quelli che ricostituirono la Confidam, Ciro D'Amico, che era il, il padre di Paolo, uh -huh. eh, e poi il primo eh, armatore, eh, dopo, perché ci fu una presidenza laica, eh, per un certo tempo, dell'associazione della, della Confidam, e, e, fu proprio Antonio D'Amico sì, dopo l'ambasciatore del, del quale io ero vicepresidente <ride> Guarda, come episodio ti posso dire eh. eh, all'epoca Vincenzo Norato litigava eh, già con Aldo Grimaldi 
già litigava con Aldo Grimaldi, quindi buon Beh, sangue non venti. Per cui litiga, litiga adesso con Manuel. <ride> quindi, eh, siccome era amico di tutte e due, sia di, di Aldo che di Vincenzo, Antonio D'Amico, il presidente, mi mandava a chiamare per fare da bacere e riuscire a mettersi d'accordo. Beh, beh, cioè, è successo, è dato i caratteri. De, degli episodi. Comunque, guarda, noi abbiamo avuto eh, a Sorrento de, insomma, eh, dei grossi armatori, il più grande di tutti è stato Lauro e attualmente è Gigi Aponte, eh beh, sì. che anche lui è sorrentino. E secondo me, contrariamente a quello che si dice, non è il secondo al mondo, è il primo, anche perché Mesk ha solamente navi portacontenitori, che attualmente non sono, non, non sono neanche in una posizione molto bene. Eh, ma eh, invece a Ponte ha navi portacontenitori e navi dei crocieri che oggi sono, vanno benissimo. Eh, quindi ecco perché ed è eh, Sorrentino anche lui. Diciamo che Napoli attualmente e non solo a Tomè, ma anche prima, anche all'epoca del, del re delle due Sicilie, eh, Napoli aveva la flotta più grande di tutte le altre flotte esistenti in Italia. Attualmente la maggioranza della flotta italiana è napoletana. Quindi praticamente in questo momento viviamo effettivamente un momento particolare grazie anche a persone come Francesco che rendono con questa manifestazione ancora pre più prestigiosa la posizione di Napoli lui è bravo e il ricordo di Guido Grimaldi? Guido Grimaldi qualche sì, tuo episodio sì. particolare con lui? Guarda, un episodio particolare di Guido Grimaldi io ero molto amico eh, l'ultimo dei fratelli Ugo sì. è stato mio compagno di banca all'istituto Nautico per tutto il periodo del Nautico quindi ho conosciuto la famiglia Grimaldi già 80 anni fa a che ha dieci anni sai, il, primo anno del, il primo anno dell'istituto nautico eh, Guido Grimaldi imbarcò da allievo ufficiale di coperta su una nave allora, di 3.000 tonnellate di duet che noi avevamo venduto ad Amico, ad Amico. ed era eh, la nave. durante la guerra fu colpita la nave da un siluro a prua e, e quindi praticamente ebbe un, un, un grosso buco nella, in quella zona riuscirono a, 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 ad ammolterci un, una terra in modo da evitare l'afflusso di acqua e il comandante chiese che voleva andare nel gavone per fare la guardia perché in caso a me veniva meno quella, quella protezione quello che si offrì fu Guido Grimaldi Pensa che se non sia mai veniva a me nella posizione, non so, io penso che tutti sappiano che cos'è un gavone, uh -huh. solamente per salire su, una scala molto stretta, un locale stretto, ci vuole molto tempo, sarebbe molto affogato sicuramente. Sfuggire, sicuramente. Certo. E quindi questo è uno dei ricordi de della personalità di Guido Grimaldi, che per me è stato uno dei migliori armatori che abbiamo avuto a Napoli. È il fratello Aldo, il decano nazionale? Come? È il fratello Aldo, dico, il decano nazionale? Il eh, fratello Aldo, Aldo. E te te che è l'unico singolo... più anziano di me in Confidarma. Eh, e, e, effettivamente è stata una persona eccezionale, un, 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 un imprenditore eccezionale. Tutti, tutti della stessa famiglia, delle brave persone. Guarda, la mamma di Manuel, la signora Paola, tu conosci benissimo, sì. che è anche amica di mia moglie, sì. <ride> pensa che ogni anno, senza che mia moglie lo chieda, perché lei è la presidente della San Vincenzo dei Paoli, attore del Greco, quindi fa della beneficenza, ogni anno, senza che mia moglie chieda niente, manda un assegno. Adesso, guarda, noi abbiamo creato un'associazione che chiamiamo Pio Monte dei Marinai, attore del greco. Beh. Questa associazione ricorda l'organizzazione Pio Monte dei Marinai, che è creata nel 1615, attore del greco. Ah, e eh. che non c'era anche a Meta? Eh, 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 poi fu fatta successivamente eh, nella zona sorrentina, a Procita, ma la prima fu Torre del Greco, nel, nel luglio del 1615. 
Eh, questo che cosa serviva? Che Praticamente eh, i marittimi eh, eh, e i proprietari delle barche davano il 25% del loro profitto nel tarrogo della chiesa di Torre del Greco, il quale utilizzava questa somma per fare la dote alle figlie dei marinai, l'assistenza sanitaria ai marittimi, ai familiari dei marittimi. Eh, Bianca, fra i primi al mondo, fra i primi al mondo è stata fatta a Torre del Greco, fatta questa qua, e soprattutto il riscatto dei marittimi, dei marittimi che venivano sequestrati dai, dai dai pirati, pirati. saraceni e questo tu sai che è stata un'esperienza un brutta assai per me per la Rosalia da madre che è stata sequestrata Come sette no. mesi in Somalia con quelle de, di mio fratello che ha avuto sequestrato due navi una nave per, dai pirati e un'altra nave dagli in indiani India. perché eh, è la nave sì. dove c'erano i famosi sì, sì. marinai che hanno sparato Come e adesso che voi la ricostituite, l'obiettivo è sempre lo stesso, questa la fondazione che voi state ricostituendo. Lo stesso, Guarda, eh, non, mi faccio lo... illusione, ah. non mi faccio illusione, noi eh, certamente lo facciamo perché si sappiano quelli che sono stati i nostri antenati, ma eh, poter, eh, no, non ci credo proprio che riusciremo, a... però siccome è collegata anche alla San Vincenzo De Paolo, di cui rende, eh, eh, a Tomer di mio figlio Umberto il Presidente, Avete quello che sarà possibile fare lo faremo. Va bene. Francesco, tu hai qualche domanda da fare al nostro Ma è amico Proprio Peppino. telegrafica, mio padre mi raccontava che i grandi armatori di una volta, del, tra le due guerre e anche del dopo, prima dopoguerra, eh, lui era contento che io... Uh, diventassi avvocato e dice ma potresti fare anche diritto di navigazione perché eh, capiva che la vita dell'armatore diciamo che era stata la sua di tante generazioni prima della sua era sempre una vita difficilissima a contatto con queste crisi forse vedeva in me eh, ecco un, una testimonianza in un settore e poi anch'io volli non avendo nessun avvocato in famiglia camminare sui miei piedi poi mio padre finì mh, la propria attività lavorativa facendo il broker assicurativo a livello internazionale come alcuni amici qui nel campo marittimo. E, mh, e, però mi raccontava papà, che tu conoscevi molto bene, eh, eh, che mh, le questioni molto spesso non erano arbitrate da arbitri professionali, domani faremo, ma eh, gli armatori si riunivano e chiedevano a un grande vecchio eh, non so chi poteva essere Angelo Costa, Ugo Fassio, Ernesto Fassio, eh, Lauro, eh, Uscini Cariello, insomma, che, eh, questi vecchi armatori di, 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 di una volta di derimere una controversia eh, tra no, due. Io so che tu dietro le quinte qualche volta hai esercitato questo ruolo questo ruolo. Chissà che non possa aiutare Mario un poco eh, tutti gli armatori italiani che poi in fondo hanno tante cose che li uniscono tra di loro che sicuramente superano le visioni diverse, i caratteri, gli interessi a volte contrastanti, gli errori di questo o di quello, eh, che magari tu non possa tessere questa tua tela dando qualche consiglio se non proprio un lodo. Eh, perché poi credo che sia interesse del nostro settore di ritrovare l'unità e qui metto anche noi che diamo servizi no, all'industria marittima quindi ci sono insigni giuristi presenti in sala, assicuratori, ho sentito Lorenzo Banchero ma altri illustri esperti quindi alla fine dovremmo sempre, mh, queste figure alcune lei nominate no? non solo rispettarle tutte io so che fondamentalmente tra i nostri armatori soprattutto quelli di maggiore storia e spessore per quanto ci possano essere dei, delle visioni diverse a volte anche dei dibattiti animali dei conflitti o anche delle, eh, però fondamentalmente c'è un grande rispetto cosa dici? legati dal mare guarda è, è un mio sogno questo di unire, unire nel senso di cercare di fare qualcosa assieme e certamente ognuno ha la sua autonomia ma cosa vuoi che ti dica 
Quando è successo la faccenda della Rosalia? Mentre 400 anni fa i nostri antenati avevano pagato per liberare i marinari, non ho ricevuto neanche una telefonata dai miei colleghi, caro Francesco. E anche per questo, guarda, ho creato questa associazione, perché si, si sappia veramente quelli che sono stati i nostri antenati e che speriamo che, non dico diventino i nostri attuali come allora, ma perlomeno ci sia maggiore... Eh, collaborazione fra di noi. Va bene, io sono sicuro che Mario farà uno splendido lavoro e quando avrà bisogno eh, di un consiglio potrà sempre venire da te. Sì, e, per e Mario tu io desidero dire questo, a parte il fatto delle sue capacità e cose, mh, è stato criticato da qualcuno perché dice lui agisce solamente eh, come rimorcatorista, non è vero, non è vero. Eh, eh, quella flotta, la mamma che di io ho avuto l'onore di conoscere aveva un'azienda di navi oceaniche successivamente eh, anche, sono... lui la... anche, lui. anche lui in parte anche ce l'ha ancora è eh, ben diversificato come sono diversificati grazie Peppino un grande applauso a Peppino grazie. e a Bianca io vi prego di rimanere qui perché